Hey, if you'd like to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Again, can I encourage you? Bibles come in different shapes and sizes. They come in the written version. They come on iPhones and, and smartphones and so on. Make sure you bring a Bible with you to church, which would be a great thing. This morning, we're, we want to continue our looking at our series uh, as we rethink evangelism. We often have a thought of what evangelism is. It's a certain approach. It's a certain you know, um, formula or a certain kind of a you know, uh, model. What it, we also often have that view. We want to invite you to rethink what evangelism is, particularly at this time as we prepare for the Hope Project 2014, which launches on the 12th of October. This is going to be a nationwide advertising blitz as well as information going to every home to invite people to engage in a conversation. Because in, in while money has been put into doing the wider uh, Hope Project, the only reason it's going to have an effect is if you and I are prepared to engage the process and encourage others to be reading the material and talking with them about what they think. It's about a conversation. It's not about a formula. It's not about, you know, a, a particular four spiritual laws. It's about a conversation of faith. And as such, we need to be, pre be prepared uh, for this opportunity to be able to engage people, whether it be in our family, our friends, uh, our colleagues, our schoolmates, our neighbours, in natural conversational ways regarding things of faith. And, and I would encourage us, let's not be bystanders to this opportunity. It's coming up. It's a month away. Uh, and... Uh, and let's not just let it pass us by. Let's be part of those who are, are going to engage the process and, and cooperate with the God of mission who is already at work in our community to be available to share our stories. And that's why we're talking about this now. So you hear about it. And we, that's why we're preparing ourselves now. It's why we're praying. And tonight we're going to be spending time specifically focused on praying for the Hope Project. Come and join us. Because it's more than just a project it's not a campaign or an event. It's about a movement of God in our nation. And it's about us you know, seizing the opportunity. And it's also about developing confidence and skill and actually being able to engage people relationally and be able to share our stories of hope. 1 Peter chapter 3. I love this picture of the koru. Don't you love korus? I really do. We have koru's around the place and you know, uh, it's so just a symbol, not only is it just an, an, a national symbol, it's a native symbol, but it's actually a powerful symbol of hope, of the potential of that which is to unfold and be revealed. The koro is a symbol of hope, and in this passage, we're going to be talking about hope. So pray with me. Father, this morning we thank you for uh, this conversation around hope. Lord, as we seek to prepare our hearts and to prepare ourselves for the opportunity that's coming up in this coming month. Lord, speak to us this morning. Lord, help us to engage with you and to engage with the process. Inspire us with your hope and indeed empower us with the stories of hope. That it might be a blessing and encouragement to others, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 3 and reading from verse 15. But in your hearts... Set apart Christ as Lord. Just pause there for a moment. This is something we need to do on a daily, weekly basis, regular basis. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. It's a thing we need to affirm in our lives. That Jesus is not only just our Savior, you know, salvation from sin and, and, and separation, but He's Lord of our lives. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Lord. And it goes on to say here, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. Think about these words. Always be prepared. He didn't say, you know, when you feel like it, or, you know, uh, when, you, when you get around to it, or, or possibly be available to. He says, always be prepared. That's the, the scout motto. Always be prepared. And what do we need to be prepared for? 
We need to be prepared to engage people and respond to the invitation for the hope that we have. You see, while there are people in the body of Christ that are called with a ministry of evangelism, And there are people who have more confidence probably in in speaking in different ways. The truth is every Christ follower, every one of us, not just the person sitting next to you or in front of you or behind you, every one of us is called to be a witness of the gospel. And we are called to be prepared. Not to um, offer four spiritual laws or have a formula on evangelism. No, we are called to be prepared, to be available to the Holy Spirit, to engage in conversations and to give the reason for the hope that we have. Now, I love hearing stories. I love hearing stories. I love hearing about people. One of the things I find is I find that people are really interesting. Do you find that? I find people intriguing. I can go to a mall and just watch people. People are interesting. If you're an observer of people, you can learn so much about their body language and, and how, what they're carrying in their life. I would encourage us to be observers of people. Be, be curious of people. I like to ask people questions. In fact, Jennifer says to me, sometimes I kind of almost interrogate people. <laughs> they come over and we're at home and, hey, so how's it going and what's going on in your life and what do you think about this? And, and nearly asking, so, you know, interrogating people. But actually, I feel I'm just engaging people. I, I believe people are interesting and I think it's important to be curious about people. I want to know things. And you know, it's as we engage people, I've discovered, as we engage people and hear their heart, that it often builds a bridge for us to better share our lives in a more meaningful way. It's often out of the context of hear, hearing others asking questions of them that it naturally comes around to, and what do you think about that? Or there's an opportunity to share our story. It's a relationship. It's a dialogue. And it's a great thing. I was um, at uh, the Calston Shopping Centre about a month ago. And uh, as I was walking up to buy a few supplies, a few things, I passed a guy that I hadn't seen for a long time. It was a guy that I'd seen at the gym. We'd talked a few times at the gym. And he hasn't been there for a while. And I haven't been there for a while. And so we hadn't seen each other for a little while. (laughs) Hadn't seen each other. And uh, we're, hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. And we got, we got conversing, had a real chat and just while everyone's kind of passing us by in, in the shopping center. And, he, and I said, so what's going on? He says, oh, man, I'm, I'm not well. I've got this back injury and I'm, I'm having surgery next week. Man of great faith and power, right? Should have prayed for him right there and then. Yeah. Kind of looked around. <laughs> but what I said to him was this. I said, how about I come over to your place? I'd like to catch up with you and talk. He said, because he said, I'm going to be laid up for six weeks following the surgery. And I said, well, I'd like to come over. How about I bring some coffees and takeaways and we'll have some, we'll catch up together. Now he's from overseas. He doesn't have any family here. He works for a, a, a well-known company. He's an intelligent guy. He's a well-paid guy. Uh, he's an engineer kind of background. And, uh, but he's on his own. And I said, look, I'm going I'm to come over to your place. So I said, I'll be there. So I turned up a couple of weeks ago, knocked on his door and I brought a couple of coffees and we began to converse and I was finding out about his life and about his home and where he's come from and, and what's going on with his back and recovery and, and we got talking about politics. You know, there's a su- couple of subjects that used to be you could never talk about things. So don't talk about religion and politics. Well, we were diving right into all of those subjects in a big way. And then he said to me, he said, so what do you, what do, you do again? I said, well, I'm actually the pastor of, uh, uh, one of the pastors at Glen Eden Baptist Church. He said, I know that church. I walked past, you used to have that big palm tree there, didn't you? I love that palm tree. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, we did too, but it had to go and all those issues. And, but it opened up a whole conversation. And, uh, and, and uh, he was starting to talk to me about his, un- his views of spirituality and about the cosmos and about the universe. And, and I really find that stuff intriguing. So I said, well, help me understand, what do you, what do you think about that? And I said, well, you mentioned this. What, why, why, do, why do you think that? And we ended up talking about all manner of science and spirituality. And it was a really, really stimulating conversation. I love those conversations. And in the process of asking questions and talking, it obviously came back to, well, well what do you think about this? I said, well, let me share with you my perspective. And so I was able to kind of give my, something, my story and my, my, my view on things. And, and we had a really interesting time. And at the end of the conversation, I said to him, look, 
you're, you know, you like learning stuff. You're going to be laid up for a while. How about I, I give you some, some uh, DVDs to look at? Uh, ones that are kind of looking at the whole thing of design and looking at the whole issue of intelligence and that there is a creator. There's a God behind what we see. And um, so I sent him a text saying, um, hey, hey, I want to mention his name. Good to catch up last Friday. Trust your back is feeling a little better. I will get to pray for him. Um, I'll pop in to see you sometime next week with a coffee, another coffee. Enjoyed our conversation and your insights about life, God, and creation. The DVDs I mentioned to you are all available on, on YouTube, and you can check them out. And I gave the whole list of things that he could look at. Anyway, he texts back saying this, Hi, Neil. They say you should never talk about religion or politics. <laughs> Maybe that's the, why the world is in the state that it is. Thanks for those movies. I'll give them a watch. Look forward to catching up soon. And it signs off. And we just had, I just thought it was a real God opportunity. And I realized, it's interesting how we forget things. I was at a Promise Keepers event a number of years ago, and we were asked to identify people that we were mixing with in our sphere of influence. I prayed for that guy, and I prayed there would be an opportunity to be able to share Jesus with him. And I remember that later on. Actually, I pray for this. this. This is a God. This is a God opportunity. So we're going to go back and have some more coffees and have some good, robust conversation. But it came because we were asking questions and inquiring, and the natural conversation opens up. And we're going into territory that is really intriguing stuff. You know, I, th- I really enjoy hearing people's stories. And um, asking questions. And actually being able to share with them. Now the challenge I think for some of us is we don't think that we've got the ability to be able to do that. Or we don't feel we've got the, you know, the apologetics or the, or the um, answers for reasons of faith. Maybe we don't feel that our stories are all that kind of, you know, substantial. Maybe we don't feel like we've got much to say. You know, maybe we don't feel like our, our testimony or our story of faith is one that's really gripping. You know, it's not like, you know, I was in the midst of darkness in my life. I was living on the edge. I, I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I was drinking two bottles of whiskey. I was running with, the, you know, the law and the gang. And then at the age of seven... Jesus radically saved my life. We don't have such a story. You don't want to have that story. But we often feel that we don't have these dramatic stories that somehow we can't tell people about what Jesus has done. And I would say, that's wrong. We all have stories. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you're breathing, then you have stories of hope. Stories, yes, of God's salvation, but stories also of God's keeping power in your life. I think, personally, that a greater testimony is not how God brought us out of the, out of the miry clay, out of, out, of the, out of the muck of life, but God's keeping power from the muck. You don't have to actually swim in a sewer to know what it's about. I think that's a great story, don't you? God's keeping power. What about stories of God's guidance or God's encouragement during difficult times when life was really against us stories of God's discovery of God's love and character and nature that have changed us we have found security and meaning and purpose stories of God's healing physically and emotionally and, and relationally all of us if we take time we can identify stories of hope in our lives we all have stories of hope. And I believe we just need to become more confident to be able to share our stories. Now, a few weeks ago, um, I talked about the power of your story. And uh, as part of that, we looked at why our stories are powerful. Stories are powerful because they are relational and personal. When we tell a story, we share something of our life, we're giving an insight to ourselves. They're relational. They're personal. They're not just a list of facts and cognitive information. No, it's something from our lives and from our heart. Stories are powerful because they are often interesting. I find people's stories, the little and large stories, quite interesting. They often can't be argued against, or not easily, because it's my experience. It was the journey that I walked through and my discovery. And lastly, they're often memorable. People won't often remember facts, but people remember stories. How often, let's be honest, you don't remember the facts that are given in a message, but you'll remember the stories. And it's true in conversation. We might not remember the cognitive facts, but we'll be impressed upon by the stories that we've heard. 
And then we talked about how we can tell great stories. And I used the acrostic of, of story, S-T-O-R-Y, as to how we can tell simple but effective stories. And, it, and it, you know, it takes a little bit of thinking about uh, but, but how we can do it naturally. But just as a guide, think about a single incident. Don't try and cram too much into a story. It's about one particular thing. I remember a time in my life when this is specific. And then there's the three magics. Where, when, and where. I told you a story about meeting this friend up at, uh, so I told you, it was a month ago, up at the Calston Shopping Centre, and we met with a friend. I've just told you the outline of the story. Then there's one punchline. What, what did you learn from that? The right length, stories need to be brief. And in stories, we need to make them personal. We need to make them relevant. They're your stories, your colour, your, your details that make it come alive. And so we talked about uh, why our stories are important. And I invited us, encouraged us, to think about some of our stories. Not just our stories of salvation, but stories of God's hope in our lives. Because it's often those stories. I, I'm, working with, I, I'm, I'm meeting with a bunch of men right now, and it's just lovely hearing their stories. There's something very powerful about the hope and, and the inside of people's stories that really is impacting upon us. So what is your story? What are some of your stories? Beginning to identify them, having a simple outline, and realizing that your stories of hope can really touch people's hearts. Well, this morning we're going to hear a bit more from Dave Mann. Uh, he is the National Director for uh, the Hope Project. We're, gonna u- we're using Dave's um, mini-seminars in our Sunday services because we believe this is important. It's a real practical way in which we can be geared up and prepared for the opportunity that is before us. So let's hear from Dave about how we can tell our stories. In the previous session, we talked about the power of our stories. God didn't work in our lives with just us in mind. He has given us stories of hope so that we can pass them on. In this seminar, we're going to talk about how to share our stories. Because having a great story is one thing, but knowing how to communicate it is another. And this is important because these are stories of hope and people need hope. Let's start with a few tips. Firstly, avoid churchy words because it puts people right off. I've been redeemed, saved, washed in the blood. Sounds more like an occultic ceremony than anything else. (laughs) We've got to drop the church jargon and talk normally. Give specific examples, but not too many, because you don't want to talk for ages. You say God made you a different person? In what way? You say your old habits faded away? Which ones? Stay focused on what you are saying. Clarify in your mind the one thing that you want to communicate through your story. A great story can become boring when it's told at length or confused by too many details being introduced. Keep it honest. We don't need to embellish our stories. Some people feel they don't actually have stories or that their stories are uninspiring and undramatic, but everyone has a story and everyone's story can teach us something. It's a case of drawing that out and then saying it simply. It doesn't have to be complicated or long. And keep it brief. In fact, we could have an additional point. Keep it brief. I'll give you one more. Keep it brief because everyone likes to talk, including the people we're talking with. If we want to impact lives in our culture, the key is probably more to listen and encourage and to ask questions than it is to talk. So let's share briefly and then try to engage them in a conversation afterwards. What do you share in a testimony? Here are three very simple things. Beforehand, What were you like before God worked in your life? What were you struggling with? What was the problem? Secondly, what happened? Where and how did God come into that picture? What did you ask God to do and why? And thirdly, what resulted? How were you changed? What did God do? For me, I grew up in a home that wasn't entirely a happy place. Then one day, my mum came to faith in God and there was sunshine in her eyes. Now, I was only 11 years of age, but my immediate thought was, I've got to have what she's got. Now, the circumstances in the home were no different, but she was different. So I decided to be God's friend for life. And the first thing that happened to me was that I suddenly realized God loved me and that God had made everybody the same. You see, I had this idea that I was somehow an inferior human being. 
I don't know where I got it from, but suddenly I realized God made everyone equal. My whole way of seeing myself and the world and other people in my class at school was changed. I was like an emotional cripple, to be honest, and I was set free. And to this day, I can't deny what happened and how I changed. I realized there was a God behind the universe and that he was a God who has made himself known. And even though I didn't know the differences between all the religions, I realized this God could be discovered through faith in Jesus. In conclusion, whenever something spiritual is mentioned in a conversation, inquire. Ask if they've had a spiritual experience because most people have. And when you've listened, you may get to share your story as well. In which case, share it clearly and share it briefly. What were things like beforehand? What happened? How did things change afterwards? Because stories of spiritual experiences are common ground with many non-believers. There is a cultural divide between us and non-believers in our Western nations. We believe God can be known. They do not. They believe everyone has their own truth or their own view of God. And that all are equally valid because it's impossible to really know God, such that one view could be right over and above another. Our stories can bridge that cultural divide and reveal a perspective that's not only different, but is full of hope. What is your story? Get ready to tell it. Then ask some people about their spiritual experiences. All right, thank you, Dave. Appreciate your contribution this morning. So what did Dave talk to us about? Well, he talked about how we can share our stories. And he talked about avoiding churchy words. And I think a lot of us are getting better at this because Christians can talk a special language all of their own called Christianese. Uh, and, it's, and it's a cultural language. And we need to actually get rid of some of that stuff if we're going to relate to people in, in real ways. Put it in words that people understand. He talked about giving specific examples, not generalizations. You know, Jesus changed my life. Well, How? What did he do? Thirdly, stay focused on what you're saying. What's the point that you're trying to get across? And keeping it honest. You see, when we're sharing with people insights or even aspects of our story, some people might not necessarily agree. They might not, that might not be their experience. But, you know, I've found that a lot of people will actually be respective of you if there's an authenticity that you have. Uh, you know, there's a respect there. And... Our world is turned off by hype. Our world is turned off. Kiwis are not interested in, you know, uh, being preached at. But if they, if they feel a sincerity, a, an authenticity, that is, that is so winsome. It really is. And then he said, keep it brief. You know, and then he said, keep it brief. And then he reminded, reminded us again to keep it brief. Have it succinct. Don't go on these long tangents and long kind of monologues. It's a dialogue. And it's putting stuff in that's provoking and, and interesting and helping people to think. Because people will go away from a conversation and they'll think about the things that were shared. Uh, yesterday, uh, Jennifer and I were with some family members um, having a coffee up in Titarangi. And I suppose because of the series, I've become more aware of opportunities. It's interesting, isn't it? That when you, when you buy a car, you bought a car, a certain kind of car, a certain color, you start to see it everywhere. It's amazing. What's changed? More cars on the road? No, you, you've just become more aware. And I think when we talk about evangelism and just being open to the Spirit's promptings, it's amazing how we become more aware of the opportunities that are around us. We were in a cafe, and we were having a really interesting conversation, and I happened to turn around, and there was a lady behind us, and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. She was Irish. She said, I was just listening to your conversation. I found it so interesting. I don't know if I got it well there, Paul, but... Uh, <laughs> To be sure, to be sure. But she was, um, she was said, I found your conversation really interesting. I was just overhearing it. Just, I apologize. And, uh, and I said, oh, what do you know about this? We were talking about uh, a, whole, a particular subject. And, and she said, oh, I learned that when I was in Ireland. And I came to New Zealand and I've done other things. And we ended up just having, I left the, the group that I was with. And I just started conversing with her. And she was just a very pleasant lady. And I asked where she'd from, how long she'd been here. And what she was doing and why she was um, in Titarangi that day. And, and then she started to talk to me about some of her experiences, that she's got into uh, uh, Reiki and um, colour therapy. And I said, look, I, I actually don't know much about colour therapy. Can you, can you let me know what that's about? I know a little bit, but I don't know. What do you understand colour therapy to be? You know, it's not some designer coming and giving you colour options on the wall. 
It's, it's a whole uh, mystical, esoteric kind of new age thing. And so she was telling me how they do this and how they call all these potions by the name of angels. And, and I said, well, it sounds like you've got a, a really interesting view of spirituality. And she said, well, yeah, I'm a very spiritual person. And she said, I've looked at many things. And I said, really, in your quest of looking at the various spiritualities, have you ever looked at Christianity? And she said, well, actually, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I said, really? I said, that's really interesting. And I said, so h- help me understand how, as a Christian, with a, a particular worldview and understanding of God and the world, h- how, how then do, do those other thoughts and other New Age ideas and various um, spiritualities fit into your understanding of God? And so we ended up having this really intriguing conversation. And so then I was able just to say, well, you know, um, can, I give you, can I give you, as a result, can I just let you give you my perspective on things? And she said, please do. Please do. She was really interested. And so I said, look, I, I, I've, from my experience and just my own journey of looking at things and exploring spirituality, I, I think that we were created by God innately to have a spiritual relationship. We were created as spiritual beings. And there is a, and I said, Pascal makes this famous quote. He says that there is a God-shaped hole in the hearts of every person that only God can fill. And she says, I, I believe that. I think that's right. And I said, well, and I think as a result, not all spiritualities are the same. Not all spiritualities come from the same source nor lead to the same source. And that we have to actually be discerning about the spiritualities because some of them are very conflictory and they're not all the same. And she said, actually, I think that could be true. And I said, so I actually believe that we are credited by God to know him. And that when we default from that place of our, our design and creation, we will look to fill out that need in our life through other things, whether, whatever that might look like or other spiritualities. But actually, the real spirituality, we've got to come back to who Jesus is. And so he began to speak about that. And, and um, she said to me, she said, I found that really interesting. Now, I just said, well, it's lovely talking with you and all the best and, and, to, and encouraged her to think about it. And that's where it led. And I don't know if I'll see that lady again. But it was just a natural opportunity. And I've just become aware of the, of the God-inspired moments and seizing those and somehow being more intentional to, to pop something into the conversation that might be a little bit more intriguing. Just to throw something in that's going to, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that before. And I think that's what we can do uh, in our conversations. Let me just wrap this up this morning by, by what do we share? He talked about in our testimony. This is about how Jesus has changed their lives. Talk about beforehand. But you know what? Too often in many testimonies, we spend so much time talking about beforehand. Uh, we talk about the sewer we've come from. But we actually need to talk about what Jesus, how we've come to know Jesus and what change that has resulted in. Or how God has brought hope into our life. And just as I land this, uh, in terms of application, what do we do with what we've heard from Dave and, and this passage that says that we need to be always prepared to give a response for the reason of the hope that we have? Can I encourage you, learn to ask questions. Be curious about people. Be interesting, because as you build that rapport, as you ask questions, it's amazing how it'll actually open up a conversation. And that's what it's really about. It's not a formula. It's not an evangelistic technique. It's about relating to another human being. And we can all do that, can't we? And the good thing is there's nothing you have to remember apart from telling your story. And then be prepared to share our stories of hope. Be prepared when someone says something and say, wow, that's a really interesting idea. I'm not sure I totally agree. Let me give you another take on it. Because I found that when I've done that, and you do it in a a nice way, you're not being, well, you're wrong. You're not doing that. You're just going, wow, that's interesting. But let me me share with you another perspective on this one. That is far more winsome, far more acceptable, far more people are open to engage, and it may lead them with something to think about that they've never thought about before. That's our part. You see, we are called to be salt and light. I love this picture, the light bulb with the the salt shaker. We're called to be a light in the world. We're called to be salt that flavors and and brings um, preservation, but, but flavors something. That's what we're called to be. Do you know that the church in the West, in the West of our world, is in decline? And we're never going to turn that around by running great Sunday services. 
If we think that the, the world is going to come to church, we, we, we've got it wrong. I believe that we need to run great services that are life-giving, that are meaningful, that are relevant, that are biblical, that truly honor Jesus, that encourage us to live our faith in the real world, right? That's what we want to be doing. But you know, the only way in which our world is going to be revolutionized is actually as we live as salt and light in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our workplaces, in our places of study, school, and so It's, It's not about being perfect. It's not about having everything sorted out. We'll never get there. That We have that view. It's about seeking to be authentic in our faith and living that out as salt and light in our world. Coming up in this next month, we're going to have a wonderful opportunity to be salt and light, to help flavor some conversations, to help be curious, help put, put some stuff into a conversation that might cause someone to think about things slightly differently because of the conversation they've had with you. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared to respond and and ask the people, hey, what did you think about that? You see those ads? You see that information? What did you think about that that came in your letterbox? This is going to be our opportunity. Let's not just be bystanders and let it kind of pass us by. Let's not be passive. Let's look for those God-inspired opportunities to engage. If we're looking for them, we'll see them. Far more often. And I want to encourage us to have that perspective. To be prepared. To give the reason of the hope that you have. And to do this not with arrogance. Not with some sense of you're wrong and I'm right. No, to do this, what did Peter say? With gentleness and respect. And if we do it in that way, how winsome and influential that will be. Let's be prepared. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for this opportunity to be reminded, to be encouraged. Lord, thank you that you came into this world to be the light of the world. You sent your son Jesus to be the light of the world. And you've called us to be a light. A light that is not hidden away, but a light that is able to be seen. And Lord, we want to reflect your light. And perfectly as we are, help us to have that influence of being salt in our world, Lord. To bring flavor, to bring interest to have an effect, an influence in the conversations, in the environments that we're in. Lord, we know it can be tough sometimes in our own families. It can be tough sometimes in our workplaces. It can be tough with our friends and our colleagues and, and our workmates, our school friends. But Lord, I pray you called us to be salt and light. Lord, in our conversation, to be prepared to give the reasons for the hope that we have, to inject into a conversation that which will provoke, that which will lovingly cause people to think differently, to invite people to explore. And Lord, I I thank you that you've called each one of us to be witnesses. Thank you afresh for your empowerment. Thank you afresh for your courage. And thank you, Lord, as we pray now for the wonderful opportunities that are going to be coming up over this next month to journey with you, the God of mission already at work in our world, to journey with you, to be available for you, to be salt and light, to share our hope that people would be influenced for the kingdom of God. Let this be so, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, God bless you. The cafe is open. There are notes available to take away this morning. So please do that. Think over this. Think about your stories. And don't forget to join us tonight as we pray and we worship together. It's going to be a great time. God bless you. Have a great week.